All right, time to look at triple integrals. This is section 5.4 of Calculus 3 by OpenStax. So we're going to define the triple integral and calculate it. So in the same way that our double integral uh, region of integration was two-dimensional here, the triple integral, it'll be a three-dimensional region of integration. And, and we just like we started with rectangles there, we'd start with a rectangular box here. So imagine a rectangular box in three dimensions. We're going to integrate the function of three variables over this rectangular box. Uh, we do in, order to, in order to do that, we need to break it up into a bunch of tiny, smaller boxes. Uh, the volume of each box will be delta x times delta y times delta z. And we're going to pick one point in the middle to evaluate the function. That point will be x star, y star, z star. Uh, since there's three dimensions, we need to sum it up three times. So uh, I goes from one to L, J goes from one to M, K goes from one to N. Uh, and then this is the value of the function times the volume of the box. So geometrically, we can't really say what the triple integral is because it's a four dimensional volume. Um, but we are taking uh, volume times the value of the function. So you could kind of think of it as uh, the summation of the function values uh, weighted by the volume. So this triple integral over this rectangular box is for a function of three variables, and then dv would have a dx, a dy, and a dz. Now, when we do this uh, according to Fubini's iterative integral process, uh, we could do x, then y, then z. Uh, x goes from a to b, and then y goes from c to d and then z goes from e to f. And by doing the three consecutive iterated integrals, we would get the overall triple integral. But how many different ways could we actually order those three integrations? The correct answer is c. You could do it six different ways. And here are those six different ways. So x first, or so x, then y, then z, x, then z, then y, y, z, x, y, x, z, z, x, y, and z, y, x. So there's six permutations for the cyclic order of doing these three integrations, and they should all give you the same result uh, if the function is well behaved. Uh, let's use some specific values here, say this cube was our uh, region of integration. And then we have some function, let's say it's x squared yz. When we go to do the integration, we pick the order that we're going to do y first. So this limit here should be for y. y should go from 0 to 3. And you notice that the points have second coordinates 0, and they have second coordinates 3. So y does go from. Uh, 0 to 3. Next up, we're going to integrate x. And x should integrate from negative 2 to 1. So you're looking at the first coordinates. They go from negative 2 to 1. And lastly, we'll integrate with respect to z. z should go from 1 to 5. Uh, the bottom here is where z is equal to 1, and the top is where z is 5. Uh, then we would just proceed with the integration. Uh, like we did with double integrals, but we just have three instead of two. Now we could change the order of integration. Instead of doing y, then x, then z, we could do x, then z, then y. But notice this changes the order of the limits. Since x is now first, it goes from being the middle limits to being the right limit. So with these limits of integration, you always go right to left. With these differentials here, you go left to right. So from the inside, work your way out. Now, doing just a rectangular box would be rather limiting. So we do want to expand to general regions. Uh, we could consider the top and bottom being two functions of two variables, like we saw in chapter four. Uh, let's say the bottom is u1 of x, y, and then the top is u2 of x and y. Uh, and then the projection of these two regions into the x, y plane is d. We could then integrate from u1 to u2, uh, where these limits of integration now have two variables. 
But notice the two variables that appear here are the variable that's not here. <laughs> so we're integrating z, and so x and y would be in the limits. Now, once that, that integral is done, we're back to a double integral, and you should know what to do. Uh, we could also have a type 2 triple integral, uh, where now I just kind of reoriented this so that y is facing up. Um, but remember, y is not always facing up. Often it's, it's pointed in this direction. And if we think of the top and bottom being functions of x and z, uh, then our first integration would be with respect to y. And this would be a type 2 triple integral. Again, once that's done, you're back to a double integral. The last, uh, last type is type 3, where x is a function of y and z. u1 is the bottom, u2 is the top. Uh, again, I kind of set x as the vertical axis here just to simplify things. And you would integrate with respect to x from u1 to u2. Now, we go back to type 1, uh, where the bottom is a function of x and y, z equals u1, and the top is a function of x and y, z equals u2. We already said that our first integral would go from u1 to u2, and we'd do dz first. That remaining double integral could still be done as a type 2 or a type 1 integral. And you see the region D that would be left over here. Uh, this is a type 1 region, where the bottom, again, you have to kind of turn your neck sideways because this is the y-axis and this is x. Uh, the bottom is g1 of x, and the top is g2 of x. So after you've taken care of kind of the third dimensional part, you still have a, a 2D double integral here that would be viewed as type 1, which means g1 and g2 appear in this middle integration, and then a and b is the final integration. Now, this same type 1 triple integral could have a type 2 double integral following. So this first part, the inner integral is the same, but I've changed the integration order at the end. Instead of doing y, then x, I'm now doing x and then y. And so you notice that for the two-dimensional region, you're bounded on the left by h1, and you're bounded on the right by h2, both functions of y. And then y itself goes from c to d. And this is going to be the case with any triple integral. After you finish the triple integral part, you have a double integral, and you have two types that could follow from it. So. Uh, look at this triple integral, where I'm integrating x, then y, then z. Uh, what kind of triple integral is it? And then what kind of double integral remains? So you should have uh, guessed answer choice C, but this is a type 3 triple integral uh, where we integrate uh, x first, and it's u1 is a function of y and z, and u2 is a function of y and z. We saw that right here. This is our type 3 triple integral. Uh, now, what's left over is a type 2 double integral with y and z. Um, you don't have to worry if it's type 1 or 2 because type 1 wasn't an option. There is no type 3 double integral. <laughs> so double integrals, there's only type 1 and type 2. Triple integrals, there's type 1, type 2, type 3. Um, so you have a type for your triple integral, and then either type 1 or type 2 for your remaining double integral. If we think of geometry again, again, the region we're integrating over is some three-dimensional solid. Uh, here it's a tetrahedron bounded by the coordinate planes and then the plane with this equation. Uh, if I don't put any function there, then it would actually just give me the volume. Now, this could have been calculated back in the previous section as a double integral where we view this as the function. And that's how it's done here, as a double integral of this function. Uh, but now, we could actually just calculate a triple integral, uh, and then the integrand uh, is just the number 1, right? So a triple integral with an integrand of 1 will just give you the volume of the region. Uh, and this might be another way you can set up calculations to find volumes. So uh, if you want the volume of the region E, just do the triple integral over E of a function 1. Now changing the order of integration is still something that you want to do and can be trickier now that we have three variables. Uh, the integrand itself, say x, y, z, is this function, doesn't change. 
Um, but say we wanted to change the order from z, y, x to x, z, y. Well, we know that if x is first, that that's a type three triple integral. And so x goes from u1 to u2. And then I have it set up here uh, where z is next and is a function of y, v1 and v2, and then y is last and goes from c to d. But what are these values? What are c and d? What are v1 and v2? What are u1 and u2? Well, in these cases, it's often best to try to take the limits on the original integral and visualize or graph this as a three-dimensional region. There's a link here to GeoGebra file where we've done this. And what I've done is I've just taken these equations and put them in to GeoGebra's 3D grapher. Now it does get a little busy, um, but you can mess around with the colors and things like that. And, and then of course you can rotate it. And then you have to eventually realize that there is some interior shape here, uh, which takes a little bit of thinking, but it's, it's sort of a shape like that. So that kind of triangular wedge that's in there, that's the interior shape. Um, if you guess if you're really good with this, you could probably limit the size of these functions so that you just see the part of them you need. Um, but once you do that, you can find these points of intersection uh, from looking at the equations and looking at the graph, you can plot them and that'll tell you the specific limits for X, Y, and Z. Uh, and then the, uh, axes here, uh, the red axis is uh, x, and then the green is y, and then the blue is z. So um, now that we kind of know what the shape is, we can think of inverting the functions and using the different limits. For instance, the outer integral where we know y goes between two numbers, looking at the y-axis, we can see that y goes from zero to one. Similarly, you can, so y goes from zero to one. Um, you can see the connection between z and y was given by the original first integral. And that same relationship can hold as your middle value for z uh, since it didn't, oops, since it didn't depend on x. Now you do need to invert the original middle one because you want x as a function of y. And so instead of y equals x squared here, you see x goes from square root of y to one. All right, last thing is the average value. You've seen in Calc 1 that the average value of a function is the integral of the function divided by the measure of the integral uh, interval you're bound integrating over. Uh, and so probably saw it as, one over b minus a, and then the integral from a to b of f of x dx. So b minus a, that's just the length of the interval you're integrating over. Um, in two dimensions, you divide by the area, and in three dimensions, you divide by the volume. So whatever the measure of the size of the region you're integrating over, you divide by that to take that part out, and, uh, and then that will give you the average value. All right, uh, we'll go to the methodology now for triple integrals. This presentation by Matthew Watts contained images and text from Calculus Volume 3 by Jed Herman and G. Strange, CC BY and CSA, OpenStax 2016.